my name is Autumn Dixon and this week is June 26th through July 2nd and we are covering the resurrection of the Savior. So the resurrection was obviously a huge miracle, <laughs> big, big, big miracle, one of the biggest ones Christ performed. And there were also lots of witnesses to this miracle. Now, interestingly enough, there was also a lot of doubt. As you read through the accounts of people who saw the resurrected Savior, and as word was spreading that he was resurrected, there was also actually a lot of doubt. And so, for example, in Mark 16, Christ is speaking with the women and he says, go tell my disciples that I have risen. And so the women run back and they bear their testimonies of Christ. And it says that the apostles thought that they were just idle tales, right? They didn't believe it. And then, of course, everyone's very familiar with the story of Thomas and how he refused to believe until he saw the Savior. And then there's also a couple of verses that I wanted to point out that stuck out to me this week that I thought were super interesting. There's two different ones. The first one is Matthew 28, verse 17. And so Christ comes to his disciples and it says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. <laughs> so they literally see the resurrected Christ and they're, they worship him, but there was still some doubt there, right? Another verse. We get a little bit more detail in this one. So this is Luke chapter 20, ver 24, chapter 24. Verse 37, and Christ came and he stood in the midst of them <laughs> and it says, but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit <laughs> because they got really worried and he's like, why are you troubled? So, so much doubt, even though they had seen Christ's power before Christ was killed, even though they had seen his power over the earth and seas and how he had power over death. They had seen all of this, and then they see the resurrected Savior, and they still experience doubt. I don't point out their doubt for judgment's sake. I point it out because I want to highlight the fact that it is a choice to doubt, a choice to doubt or a choice to believe. Because what is doubt other than faith and another story? Right? So these people, they're looking at Christ and doubt, doubting that he's really standing in front of them or that he is him or whatever it might be. They're simply choosing to believe that there had to be another explanation for what their eyes were seeing. Doubt is simply a choice to believe in a different story or to believe that the story that's being told to you might not be true. I point out the doubt in this story so that we can better understand our choice when it comes to doubt and belief. Now, how do we believe? How do we nurture belief? I think it is significant to talk about because, not just because of the innate importance of belief, but also because it makes life so much easier. Imagine if the disciples had chosen to believe the women who came and were like, we saw the resurrected Savior, or we saw the angels. If they had chosen to believe the women, how much faster they would have been able to rejoice. Or Thomas, if he had chosen to believe his friends, he would have been able to rejoice that much faster, or he would have been spared that fear of disappointment that it wasn't what they thought it was. When we can choose to believe, believe the story that Christ has told about himself, we can realize so much sooner that our happiness is far safer than we ever realized. Now, I want to talk about three different ways that we can nurture belief. And the first one has to do with Thomas, right? What can we learn from Thomas? Thomas is told by his closest friends. Some of, well, I would assume they're his closest friends. He spent a lot of time with them. Some of his closest friends that Christ has risen again, and this is his response. So this is John, it is 20, verse 25. It says, the other disciples therefore said unto him, Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. 
Now, when I read this story, what I actually see, yes, there's a stubborn Thomas there. <laughs> but what I really see is fear. I see a man who experienced such deep tragedy over the death of the Savior that it still haunts him, that the idea that the Savior could be back is too scary to believe until he knows it, until he can see for himself that the price of that hope could cost him dearly. And there are a lot of reasons that people choose to doubt, and I think that tragedy is often one of them, that something really difficult happens and it closes them off because they don't want to experience that again, that they start to find wisdom and doubt until the belief can be proved so they don't have to experience tragedy or at least experience disappointment when tragedy comes and make it that much more bitter. They see that the potential cost of hope is too high. And the cost of hope can be too high. It can be too high when we place our hope in the wrong things. So if you are hoping for a child to go away or for a specific miracle to drop into your lap, Disappointment can very well be around the corner. Not always. Sometimes the Lord answers our prayers exactly how we want them, them answered. But sometimes the Lord can't because he knows better. Because of his wisdom, he knows that he can't give us exactly what we want. There are some hopes that will cause disappointment, but there are some hopes that we can have that will never let us down. There's a verse in the Book of Mormon. Lots of reading today. There's a verse in the Book of Mormon. This is Ether chapter 12, verse 4. It says, Wherefore, whoso believeth in God, wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, make, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. And I want to point something out in that verse. It doesn't say believe in God and that he can do this, 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 A, B, and Z. What it says is whoso believeth in God can hope for a better world. Belief and hope and faith are so much more manageable and less disappointing and doable when we place them in the right things, when we place them in God, pure and simple, unadulterated belief in God and wherever he chooses to lead us. When we place constraints on God and he can't grant those constraints because he knows better, we are only restraining our own happiness. I think about Thomas and what constraints he might have placed on the Lord and why Christ's death was particularly tragic to him and devastating to him. And don't know for sure, obviously, just trying to point out possibilities so that maybe we can recognize ourselves. Maybe Thomas saw all the times that Christ had escaped from the Pharisees and scribes and seen all the times that he had outsmarted them. And he had just told himself over and over again, there's no way, there's no way that God would let this man die, that he would let his son die. And he, Thomas, placed this constraint on God. Christ had to die. We needed it. He had to die. <laughs> and yes, plain and simple, Christ had to die. Can you imagine if God had just given Thomas what he wanted because of how much Thomas believed it? Would have been disastrous, right? And it's the same with our own personal plan of salvation, right? There's the big plan of salvation that is for everybody that we can follow, but then there's personal little plans of salvation that the Lord has for us in our specific lives for our own salvation. The Lord cannot always give us exactly what we want, no matter how much we believe in it. No matter how much we believe in it, he can't just give us what we want. If we are looking to avoid disappointment or looking to avoid escaping dis or looking to avoid disbelief, we have to change. 
and to simply believe in God, no matter where God decides to lead us, to just simply believe in God. And that way, when we face the inevitable tragedies of mortal life, we're able to retain our belief. Second way I want to talk about nurturing belief. As you are reading through the chapters this week, I want you to take note of how many people doubted until they heard the Savior speaking and explaining. <laughs> because it happens a lot, right? Christ is standing before them and they're kind of shocked and they don't really get it. <laughs> And then they're either reminded of something that Christ said before or Christ explains what's happening. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and it makes sense, right? Christ explains it. And all of a sudden it makes sense what their eyes couldn't make sense with. And maybe that is because the spirit doesn't often work through our eyes, right? Somehow the spirit, speaking to our spirit, leaves a bigger impression than what our eyes take in, right? A deeper impression. And so if we want to nurture belief, we go where the spirit goes. The women were the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And maybe there was some deeper purpose for that, but I think one of the main purposes was simply because they went to the tomb. <laughs> they went where they could witness it, right? Right. We have to go where the spirit goes. And as I've grown older, I've realized that going where the spirit goes is more a state of mind than a physical place. The spirit can reach you in the deepest, most pitiful parts of hell, right? And if you don't let the evil in, if you are able to stay clean, the spirit can still dwell within you. Now, there's a reason as you're growing up, you're taught, don't go into that place because the spirit can't follow you in there, right? We're taught that. And I think there's wisdom in that, right? Because it can be much harder to hear the spirit in specific locations. But even if you're in the most peaceful place on earth, you will not be able to hear the spirit unless you create a place in your mind for the spirit unless you can create a peaceful place and when i say that i don't mean that you can't be experiencing turmoil in order to feel the spirit that's not what i'm saying it doesn't mean that you have to be perpetually positive and you turn a blind eye to anything that might be confusing you you don't even have to do that that's not what it means to create a place where the spirit can reside within you Really, all it means is being willing to listen to what the Spirit wants to tell you and to be willing to believe what the Spirit tells you. So when I was on my mission, I was experiencing turmoil. turmoil. Can't even remember what it was. <laughs> but it was really affecting me. And my companion was in the shower, so I had some quiet time. And I was praying about it. I remember in that dingy couch. <laughs> I was praying about it. And... I made space for the spirit. Even though I was struggling, I specifically created space in my mind and in my heart. However abstract you want to explain that, I created spirit, a place for the spirit to still speak to me. And I felt the Savior sitting with me and he didn't fix anything, didn't explain anything. I just felt him with me as I was struggling and it made all the difference. It made it very easy to hold on to that belief in the midst of turmoil. And as I've experienced turmoil throughout my life, when I remember to create a space for the spirit, I find that same experience and I'm able to hold on to belief. Third thing that I wanna talk about in nurturing belief, retaining our belief. This is very similar to the second one, but I wanted to highlight it separately because it's different enough, I guess. So the spirit, not the spirit, the scriptures. Christ used the scriptures. So when he would stand before people and they were confused and he'd explain it, there are also specific times where he used the scriptures. And it happens frequently. He did it with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Or he would be like, hey, remember these scriptures that explain it? And he would unfold the scriptures. There's even a very specific verse 
And that says they went to the tomb and he wasn't there and they didn't get it because they did not yet understand the scripture about it. Scriptures. So the scriptures are, as we've been taught our entire lives or since we've joined the church, the scriptures are another tool that can help us learn how to hear the spirit, how to hone that skill of hearing the Lord through the voice of the spirit. It reminds me of Thor. <laughs> if you have ever watched the Marvel movies or Thor specifically, he has this hammer, Mjolnir, hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> he has this hammer that he got from his dad. And this hammer helped him learn how to use his power. But as he progresses through his character arc, he learns that the hammer is not the source of his power. He always had the power. It was within him. However, the hammer helped him focus it and learn how to use it. And it's the same with the scriptures. We have the power to feel the spirit, but the scriptures make it a lot easier to focus it and to learn that particular skill. It makes it a lot easier. And we see this happen. <laughs> so the people, they like see this see the Savior and they're kind of confused or something happens or they hear that the Savior is resurrected. It's all very confusing until the scriptures are explained to them and they're like, oh yeah, that checks out. <laughs> that makes sense, right? And I think that's for a lot of reasons. The scriptures help us hear the Spirit. They also explain things that are occurring really well. <laughs> and I think it is also because life is like the ultimate Montessori school. So if you're not familiar with Montessori schools, they are schools that their emphasis is to allow children to learn by exploration. Kids have a lot more options in what they're learning, what they're choosing to learn, and it's a lot of exploration. However, if you want a good Montessori school, you have to make sure there is also adequate supports placed, right? You can't just throw the kids in the room and just be like, go figure things out yourself. They explore and they learn a lot, but it is best when there is enough support and guidance from adults to guide these kids through these principles and the things that they're exploring. It's a lot like life. <laughs> the Lord threw us in the middle of mortal life. Well, I guess technically the beginning of mortal life. And we just got to start experiencing everything, right? And people who don't have the scriptures, they can still learn a lot of good things. They can learn what it means to have a happy life by choosing to do good and to be a moral person, right? But when you're given gospel knowledge, when you have the scriptures in front of you explaining things, you can learn it so much faster. <laughs> at least as a general rule it's not applicable to everybody but as a general rule I feel like you can learn it so much faster it can take your knowledge to new heights you can learn adjacent principles to what you're learning and then you can take those principles and you can apply them to new situations it just makes the learning experience so much easier I am grateful for my savior I am grateful that he had the power to become resurrected. I am grateful that he was patient with people who didn't understand what was happening in front of their eyes. Because heaven knows I've seen plenty of things that I probably missed. <laughs> I'm grateful that he gives us tools so that we can learn the voice of the Spirit. I am grateful that he has walked me through tragedy in the past and helped me to cultivate more faith in just him and where he wants to lead me because he knew it would make me happier. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.